Wired by a 111L Laboratory 5. Objectives. By the end of this lab activity, you should be able to describe the requirements and products of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Describe how various plant structures contribute to the process of energy transformation. Identify the optimal wavelengths required for photosynthesis. Understand and apply the principle of paper chromatography to separate pigments. And explain the effects of temperature, humidity, and light wavelength on the process of photosynthesis. All living things need energy to power the processes of life. For example, it takes energy to grow. It also takes energy to produce offspring. In fact, it takes energy just to stay alive. This is why we must consume calories in order to keep up with our body's demand for energy. What must we consume? When you look at the food you eat, you can break it all down into these following groups of molecules, carbohydrates or sugars, lipids or fats, and proteins or amino acids. And of course, we can't forget oxygen. We must consume oxygen as well in order to stay alive. We need oxygen because our bodies use oxygen to process the food we eat into energy. This is the process by which we obtain most of the energy in our body. We can trace back all of the oxygen, lipids, carbohydrates, and protein we eat back to the plant source. The basis of almost every food chain on earth is the plant. Plants are called producers because they make their own food. A plant provides energy for the primary consumer that eats it. A secondary consumer then eats the primary consumer who ate the plant. So now the secondary consumer benefits from the energy provided by that same plant. That secondary consumer can then be consumed by a tertiary consumer and so on. So if plants provide energy for the whole food chain or food pyramid, where do plants get their energy from? The answer is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process by which the energy of sunlight is converted into energy of glucose. This process requires sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. This process produces glucose and oxygen. Photosynthesis takes place in specialized structures inside the plant cells called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts contain light-absorbing molecules called pigments. These light-absorbing pigments are required in order for photosynthesis to take place. These light absorbing pigments also give plants their color. Pigments will absorb some wavelengths of light but will reflect others. We see the color or colors that the pigment reflects. Chlorophyll is the pigment inside chloroplasts that absorbs light for photosynthesis. Chlorophyll gives plants their green appearance. As the chlorophyll in leaves decays in the autumn, the green color fades along with it. The greens are then replaced by oranges and reds from other plant pigments called carotenoids, which are usually masked by the chlorophyll's green color. Photosynthesis is just the beginning of the story. Photosynthesis is how plants make glucose. This glucose, which is a sugar molecule, is used in the plant to provide energy and to provide basic structural building blocks for the complex molecules such as protein and DNA. Here is the equation for photosynthesis. Six carbon dioxide molecules plus 12 water molecules in the presence of light energy will produce one glucose molecule, six oxygen molecules, and six water molecules. Plants manufacture their own sugar. 
or glucose, whereas animals must eat or consume glucose. But both plants and animals use glucose for energy. The process by which both plants and animals release the potential energy that is stored in glucose is called cellular respiration. In cellular respiration, the products that were made in photosynthesis, the glucose and the oxygen, are then used in cellular respiration. Here is the equation for cellular respiration. Glucose and oxygen are used to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of ATP that the cells can use. Plants have had to evolve to maximize their ability to perform photosynthesis. The roots absorb water and nutrients and store carbohydrates as well as anchor the plant to the ground. The stems allow the plant to have a height advantage because leaves that are higher tend to catch more sunlight. The stems also can store carbohydrates as well. The leaves have evolved to become broad in order to maximize the surface area for light to hit it. The leaves of plants also contain stomata. The stomata are tiny holes in the leaves that function as sites of gas exchange. Gas exchange for a plant means that carbon dioxide goes in and oxygen is released. Water vapor can also escape through the stomata, so the stomata will close when it's hot and dry in order to conserve its water stores. Photosynthesis only occurs when the light received is within a certain range of wavelengths. Plants use wavelengths of light that are in the visible light range. The visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is between 380 nanometers and 750 nanometers. We experience the perception of color because the object we may be observing can be reflecting some wavelengths and absorbing all the rest. Whatever wavelength or wavelength of visible light an object reflects determines the color or colors we see. If the object reflects all wavelengths, it will appear white. If the object reflects no wavelengths, it will appear black. The primary pigments used in plants for photosynthesis are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. They both reflect green light, but they have different wavelengths that they maximally absorb. In addition to chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, many plants also contain accessory pigments which act to expand the range of light wavelengths that can be absorbed and used for photosynthesis. These other pigments appear to us as the reds, golds, and oranges that we see in the fall. Here are some of the accessory pigments that are rather common. Carotenoids reflect yellow, orange, and red wavelengths of light. And those cyans reflect red, blue, and violet wavelengths of light. Xanthophils will reflect yellow wavelengths of light. When we explore the effects of temperature on photosynthesis, we find that most plants prefer temperatures of around 25 degrees Celsius. As temperatures get further away from 25 degrees Celsius, photosynthesis rates continue to decrease until they essentially cease at extreme temperatures. When we explore the effects of water intake on photosynthesis, we find that plants need about 30% of their maximum water intake in order to photosynthesize at a maximal rate. As a plant's water intake decreases below 30%, the rate of photosynthesis steadily decreases to zero at 0% 0 water intake. Plants enjoy weather consisting of approximately 45% humidity or higher. 
This is because humidity allows the plant to conserve its water stores. When conditions are dry, plants can become dehydrated and can die. When we look at the effects of light color on photosynthesis, we find the following. Plants use primarily chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B to capture the light energy used for photosynthesis. Chlorophyll A and B reflect green wavelengths of light. So the best color of light to use to grow healthy plants indoors we see is white light. And the worst choice would be green light. Most plants function best with a minimum concentration of carbon dioxide of about 0.1% or higher. This week for your laboratory assignment, you will be performing paper chromatography, comparing density of stomata, and a phenol red experiment. There are some concepts you will need to know in order to be successful in this week's lab. Let's do a quick overview of the lab activities and discuss what it is that you will need to know before you begin. Paper chromatography is a useful technique used to separate liquids based on their solubility. You will need a chromatography chamber, a solvent, and a piece of chromatography paper. Prepare your chromatography paper by cutting the bottom portion of your chromatography paper into the shape of a V. Next, you will use a pencil to draw a line above the V. Don't use a pen because a pen will bleed into the paper and will ruin your results. This line is where you will place your sample of your plant extract. You will want to make sure that the extract is placed high enough on the paper so that it does not touch the solvent when placed in the chamber. Next, place a line of plant extract on the pencil line. This line is called the origin and indicates the starting point of your sample. Then, carefully place the chromatography paper in the chamber. Make sure that the line of plant extract, which is on your origin, is not in contact with the solvent. You will wait for about 15 minutes before you will notice any separation. Let's discuss what is happening. The chromatography paper is highly absorbent and pulls the solvent into itself against gravity. It does this using something called capillary action. You should also notice that as the solvent passes through the extract, that the extract moves, changes colors, and separates. When you are done, remove the paper from the chamber and lie it down flat. You will identify the plant pigments by measuring the RF values and comparing them to the RF values given in the table. The origin is where you placed your sample at the pencil line. The solvent front is the highest point on the chromatography paper that the solvent reached. The RF value is going to be the ratio of how far your compound traveled from the origin over the distance between the origin to the solvent front. You will also be comparing the number of stomata on the top of a leaf versus the bottom of a leaf. In order to do this, you will obtain a dry leaf and then brush clear nail polish on both sides, top and bottom. Then you will take two microscope slides and label one T for top and the other B for bottom. Wait for the polish to dry. 
Once the polish has dried, you will be able to peel the polish off, mount it on the slides, and cover slip. Next, you will view your slides under the microscope and compare the amount of stomata that you see between the top of the leaf and the bottom of the leaf. The last experiment you will be doing is the phenol red experiment. In this lab, you will be indirectly measuring the reactions of photosynthesis and cellular respiration by measuring the change in carbon dioxide levels. You will be using an aquatic photosynthesizing plant called Elodia. The Elodia is going to be immersed in a pH indicator called phenol red. When we compare the chemical equations for cellular respiration and photosynthesis, we can see that if there is more photosynthesis taking place in the plant than cellular respiration, we will get a decrease in carbon dioxide levels. However, if the plant is undergoing more cellular respiration than photosynthesis, we should see an increase in carbon dioxide levels in the solution. Here's a quick overview of the experimental design. You will be preparing four samples. One sample will be incubated in the dark, along with one sample having phenol red only with no elodia as a negative control. One sample will be incubated in the light, along with one sample having phenol red only with no elodia as a negative control. For this experiment, you will obtain a test tube with some pH indicator called phenol red, which will appear pink or reddish. Then you will need to place a straw into the phenol red solution and gently exhale, creating bubbles. When you exhale, you are adding carbon dioxide into the solution. Carbon dioxide makes the solution more acidic. The phenol red will turn yellow when the solution becomes acidic. Here is a demonstration of the color change of phenol red. Once you have blown enough air into the solution to get the phenol red solution to turn yellow, remove the straw and add some melodia. Phenol red will appear yellow under acidic conditions. It will appear pink under basic or alkaline conditions and orange under neutral conditions. Neutral is a pH of around 7.0. Let's see what carbon dioxide does to pH. When carbon dioxide decreases, the hydrogen ion also decreases. When the hydrogen ion decreases in the solution, the solution becomes more basic. So the phenol red turns pink. When carbon dioxide increases, the hydrogen ion concentration will also increase and the solution will change to yellow, becoming acidic. Neutral solutions of phenol red will appear orange. After the incubation period, you will compare the colors of the solutions. You will need to determine what reaction or reactions are occurring in the light from your collected data and explain why. You will need to determine what reaction or reactions are occurring in the dark from your collected data and explain why. Thank you for watching.